An Interpretation of Fascism by Claude Sutton. Fascism, in the sense in which it will be used in this article, is an awkward and inconvenient term to describe the world movement which has emerged in our time to compete with Marxism and liberal democracy for men's allegiance. It should undoubtedly be confined to naming the special form which this movement has taken in Italy. Nevertheless, the popular mind, feeling that in Italian fascism, something new and of worldwide import had emerged, persists in using the term in a wider sense. Fascism is not international as communism is, in the sense of being a dogma to be thrust down the throat of every nation regardless of its history and circumstances, it is rather an underlying similarity of outlook which can be detected in various modern national movements, and which may be seen to emerge with a kind of necessity from the situation in which our European culture finds itself at present. We in England share in the common cultural inheritance of Europe just as we were most profoundly affected by the ideas of the French Revolution. So we are bound to be deeply affected by the ideas of the fascist movement and to react to these ideas in our own particular national way. The two factors which are everywhere giving birth to this movement are the decay of liberal democracy and the rise of Marxism. It needs but a slight acquaintance with history to realize that there is nothing inevitable or eternal about liberal democracy compared with other forms of government. Democratic governments have neither been common nor stable, nor have they contributed much of enduring value to human culture as have aristocratic and monarchical governments. Of course it is possible, and often done, to define democracy in such a way that to include in all tolerable forms of government whatever. For instance, to describe England under Queen Elizabeth or under Pitt as a democracy. But this is a gross misuse of language and a debasing of the intellectual currency. Democracy should not be used to denote every government which rules by the consent of nearly all the governed nor one which consciously pursues the welfare of the whole people, nor one which is a tolerant of a variety of opinions and encourages free discussion, nor one which rules according to settled and known law, impartially applied. Many democratic governments have failed conspicuously in these respects. Many non-democratic governments have exhibited these virtues in a high degree. It is absurd to call democracy any government which is not tyrannical. Democracy is one particular historical form of government which has sometimes worked to the general satisfaction, sometimes not. Its chief feature would seem to be the decision of all important questions by majority vote, either of the people, of the whole people, or of the large representative assemblies. Democracy, as we know it in Western Europe and America, which I shall hereafter term liberal democracy, is a special product of the French Revolution and upon the peculiar theories of certain influential thinkers of that era. The underlying philosophy of human nature on which it is based has not always been accepted by thinking men, and there is no reason to suppose that its sway over men's minds will be eternal. On the contrary, there is considerable evidence that the philosophy of the rights of man and of the citizen no longer carries conviction, and that the system of government based upon it is therefore doomed to pass away. Like other political philosophies, it did not win general acceptance without a struggle. But today, who can detect any difference between conservatives, liberals, and right-wing non-Marxian labor in respect of their ideals or the greater general or the general character of their of the methods by which they propose to realize them? 
What are the philosophical assumptions or axioms of this system of liberal democracy? The first is that all men are equal, at least to the extent that they must have an equal share in the government. The second is that government only exists in order to prevent any man interfering with equal liberty of others. J.S. Mill. Or, as forcibly expressed to me by a student, government only exists to enable every man to go to hell in his own way. The third, that such individual liberty results in the greatest possible satisfaction of all. Fascism is based on the denial of all these principles. To the first, it replies that all men are not equal in their capacity for cooperative enterprise. And government is a cooperative enterprise. Men differ markedly in respect of courage, fairness, loyalty, veracity, and other qualities of character which are required for any corporate undertaking. Such qualities are not monopoly of any class, nor dependent on education in the ordinary sense of the word. Some men are markedly deficient in them. All the Bolshevik leaders, for example, if we were to believe their confessions, any one of us would try to exclude them from power in any organization for which he, has res for which he was responsible. Political representation must be based on a selective system of real groups whose members are personally ac acquainted with one another. A good political system should not even try to ensure that all opinions have equal weight. To the second principle, it observes that equal liberty is impossible, for men do not all want to do the same things, that every system of law presupposes some positive ideas as to what is objectively good or bad for everyone, that the principle is either meaningless or disastrous. To the third, that owing to the nature of man and society, the greatest possible sum of satisfaction cannot be achieved by the system of maximum individual liberty. Nor is this greatest happiness of the greatest number everyone to count for one and no one for more than one the end of life men are and should be more interested in the welfare of their own family their own profession their own neighborhood their own nation and good government should take account of this fact we shall return to these points later liberal democracy is a lazy philosophy Instead of making up one's mind what ought to be done and fighting tenaciously to get it realized, the good democrat waits and sees which way the majority would jump. Secure in his belief that the voice of the masses is the voice of God. We must not even seek to persuade people of today the driving power of liberal democracy as everywhere run down. Few people wholeheartedly believe in, in its slogans. Half present-day advocates, half its present-day advocates, are really timid Marxists. Their avowed end is equal wealth for all, and democracy is merely a means to this. They fondly imagine that this end can be achieved by mere voting, without force, at least in the distant future. They frequently betray their contempt for individual liberty as such. They are envious, but they care for their skins, such as the Lib Lab Social Democrats. What is the philosoph philosophical basis of the unholy union, the unholy alliance between communists and democrats? Wherever fascism appears on the scene, to this problem we must now turn our attention. Communism, or better, Marxism, for there are many Marxists outside of the Communist Party, is altogether a product of individualistic, egalitarian philosophy of liberal democracy. Frequent in history have been revolutionary movements of the less fortunate classes. This one has taken over the peculiar ideology of the Victorian, early Victorian era of, in which it was born. 
it too conceives a community as a collection and social happiness as a sum. It accepts the first two principles of liberal democracy. All men are equal, though there is no God, and therefore they may, they ought to have not merely equal political rights, but equal wealth. Again, happiness is to be achieved by giving everyone equal wealth and then letting them do what they like with it. When once economic equality is achieved, the state is to wither away. But it is most empathetically, but it most empathetically rejects the third principle of liberal democracy. That this happy condition of things comes about by letting people alone. Laissez faire is the ultimate aim when one economic equality has been achieved, but this has to be achieved by the forcible dictatorship of the pro proletariat, that is, of the unskilled factory worker. Its central doctrine is the class war between proletarians and the capitalists. It persists in hurting all mankind into these two pens, although no economist any longer takes seriously the surplus value theory upon which the distinction was based. How unreal the two pens are. There is indeed conflict between groups, and such conflicts is the, of the essence of a live community. But a large proportion of the inhabitants of the modern state, who live on the joint proceeds of their work, and of the property needed to make that work fruitful, cannot be squeezed into either pen, except a tour de force. Except a tour de force. And are not the conflicts of interests between townsmen and countrymen, between manufacturers and financiers, between craftsmen and unskilled laborers, between racial groups and religious groups, just as real and vital as this alleged one between capitalists and the proletariat? The key note of Marxism is the class war, in which all other methods are allowable. All methods are allowable. That is why, whenever, wherever it raises its head, politics becomes so embittered and so dirty it destroys all sense of moral unity of the nation which previously mitigated conflicts between groups. That is why they must be fought to the death, but, it's, but it will be said, has nothing of any value been achieved through the communist experiment in Russia? and that there is no resemblance between the dictatorships, quote-unquote, of communism and fascism. It is impossible to understand the development of communism in Russia unless we distinguish the present stage of Bolshevism and retreat, as it has been termed, from the earlier stage in which the doctrine, doctrinaire communism had sway, full sway, this earlier stage was marked by an unparalleled destruction for the sake of the class war theory of the human and material resources of the nation, of farmers, technicians, and teachers of cattle, of machines, buildings, and art treasures. The same phenomenon has manifested itself in Spain and else elsewhere wherever Bolshevism has seized power. When after some 10 years, production had reached such a low level that it seemed the limit of uh, that it has seemed the limit of human endurance had been reached, the doctrines were largely abandoned, and with the help of capitalist credits, foreign technicians and machinery, and stack stackanovis driving of the worker the workers a beginning was made to build up again certainly the change of heart is far from complete one, one symptom of it seems to be the present conflict between Stalin the robust undoctrinaire brigand from the caucus and the Jewish gang who here though here there to controlled Russia 
and are now largely eliminated. Russia has not abandoned the common turn and the Marxian idea of world revolution, but for herself she seems to be seems to have tactically abandoned the equalization of wealth and the dictatorship of the proletariat and to be building up a powerful nationalistic state. Under Stalin, there are signs of a sort of shame-faced fascism with a guilty conscience emerging. If this was to be the end, at what cost has it been achieved? Fascism has arisen out of the decay of liberal democracy and in response to the menace of Bolshevism. Unlike Bolshevism, it was not the putting into practice of an academic theory. It, re it arose in response to an actual situation and can therefore only be understood in the light of the two world movements which it is destined to supersede. Originally, it was a kind of instinctive reaction of the European man to the forces of disorder, materialism, plutocracy, and cosmopolitan, uh, cosmopolitanism. It is at one with the communism in denying absolutely that there is a pre-established harmony which makes the greatest happiness of, of all result from the greatest liberty of each, but this is all that it has in common with communism. It takes a radically different view from both communism and liberal democracy with the regard to happiness, which the state is to secure, for it conceives the nation as an organic unity of many different functional groups, and of each these each of these represents a certain unique contribution to the nation, with its own type of life, which must be fostered. If the right relationship between these groups are, dis dis are disturbed, there can be no enduring happiness or soundness in the state. We could, said Plato, make our potters much happier by allowing them to lie on the couches before the fire, eating and drinking and turning, the wheel turning their wheel when they felt like it. But do not advise them to do this, for our potters would no longer be potters, nor our farmers be farmers. Moreover, it conceives a nation, in the words of Burke, as a partnership not only of the living, but of the living with the dead and with those that are yet unborn. If it is something that endures with human natural resources, which may be wasted or which may be made more fertile. A movement has come into power of, in each of the fascist countries, quote-unquote fascist countries, with a will to make the best out of their national estate, as the old noble landowner did out of his own family and estate. This is what has been called the religion of blood and soil. It is evident that these movements cannot admit the unlimited rights of majorities. They cannot, for instance, permit a present majority of townsmen to wipe the countrymen out of existence, nor to enjoy the utmost possible present wealth at the expense of future power. The evils which the rule of the short-sighted majorities bring, the decay of public honesty, uh, the, the, the clay of public honesty and the spirit of self-help, the decay of the family, of mental health, mental and physical fitness, the decay of lands, forests and ships can only be cured by giving a great scope and independence to leaders. Fascism evidently must and does denote itself its chief efforts to strengthen, strengthening the, weak, the weakest links in the national chain, that is, in improving the conditions of those groups which are hardest pressed. It cannot, however, admit equality between the lazy and the active, between imaginative and the routine, in, imaginative and routine work, even as a far-off ideal. Fascism affirms the immutable, beneficial, fruitful inequality of men. 
quote by Mussolini. Liberal democracy is paralyzed by the rivalry of functional groups, whose existence, is, whose existence it pretends to ignore. Fascism recognizes these and bases its representative system upon them, believing that it can master their potential conflicts with a strengthened national sense of unity and the leadership principle, the principle of individual responsibility. Democracy, the principle of control by anonymous, anonymous majorities, is on its trial in the industrial, no less in the political field. In the economic sphere, the aim of fascism, conforming to its general over outlook is to achieve the most the utmost possible security and stability for all producers not the maximum freedom of choice for consumers to this end international trade must be reduced to a subordinate and auxiliary position in the interest of national planning and ethical considerations considerations as to the kind of life which should be encouraged or discouraged, must often override economic. There is nothing in fascist nationalism which is incompatible with the well-understood interests of other nations. Its foreign policy is based on the principle of minding one's own business and being ready to fight for a certain well-known vital interests and only these. It is naturally opposed to the democratic, e e e equalitarian, and universalistic principles of the League of Nations. It wants friendly cooperation with those coordinate nations with whom it actually has interests in common, based on the planned elimination of possible causes of friction. It wants leadership in international affairs at home. In Europe, its task is to rebuild the concert of Europe, which the founders of the League of Nations destroyed. Finally, we may attempt to answer the objections so often heard that fascism subordinates the individual utterly to the state, a living being into an unreal abstraction. The answer to this is implicit in, in the foregoing. Government the fascist conceives does not me exist merely to increase the happiness of individual citizens. It is a trustee for the enduring national culture and for the material resources which forms this necessary basis. Without this, the individual would be nothing, nor can he divert himself of it, even as if he leaves the territory of the state. It is the whole sum of ancestral traditions which differentiates him from a stone man, stone age man, a government which secures the harmonious development of different culture bearing groups and prevents them and not prevents them annihilating one another has a claim on our allegiance. But the state is a mere piece of machinery, a mere container, as Hitler said for the people conceived as an enduring biological and cultural entity, fascism is not etastist, et unlike Hegelians. It does not worship the state as much. Historically considered, it presents the analogies with the ancient European sea forms as it was before the Orentine Orentes, Orontes began to flow into the Tiber before the rise of abstract individualism and the desire for salvation in another life. Again, it presents analogies with, with feudalism with its conception that government must be based on the idea on the personal loyalty of man to man, the, prim, the primeval Teutonic idea of comet Comitatus. Further, it reminds one of the aim of the medieval guilds to regulate production in the interests of all categories of the producers. Like every big movement, it has its roots in the past, 
but it is no mere hackling back to outworn systems. It is unintelligible, for apart from the essential modern conceptions of nationality, race, voluntarily, uh, voluntary trade associations, the divorce, the divorce of ownership from management, the idea of liability without the fault, interacting cultures as opposed to a one-track civilization, and many others. It is through and through modern a creature of our time. Five years ago, it seemed to many of us that there was no choice except between the not very palatable alternatives of individual liberal democracy and Marxian socialism. Now, there is a third alternative.